Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Welcome to the Sportages videocast. Uh, I'm your host today, Furkan, and joining me today is an Austrian tennis player who is a man of brilliance and still showing his resilience at the court at the age of 40 when other people usually retire. So if you're a tennis fan, you probably would have heard of him. You probably would recognize him. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, former doubles Grand Slam winner and former world number doubles number world number two, Oliver Marak. Welcome to the show, Oliver. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks for the interview. No worries. Let's just begin and kick off the conversation. So how are you doing amid the pandemic, especially when sport obviously took a took a hit? But how is tennis doing? And most importantly, how are you doing? Well, right now I'm I'm past the first 12 weeks playing again on the tour. Uh, it was quite challenging, I have to say, because nobody knew how it's going to be. Obviously, we had a lot of testing going on. I think every player who played the whole 12 weeks had between 30 and 40 PCR tests. Uh, the rules were like, uh, we come to a tournament, um, we have to go directly into testing, and then we have to stay uh, most of the time 24 hours in quarantine in our room to get the first result. If we are negative, we can go to the site and practice. And then every third or fourth day, we had to do another test. Um, we're living basically in a bubble, so that means uh, we were just allowed to be in the hotel or to be uh, on the site. So there was no going out, going to restaurants or anything else. Wow, that must be challenging, definitely. And it's it's everything on top of obviously being passionate about the sport and being committed to it. Um, so Oliver, um, obviously uh, it's a very basic question and you must get, get uh, this asked a lot, but who is Oliver Marak and how did he get into tennis? And what basically prompted you to take a career in it? story is uh, maybe a little bit different to other tennis players because I started playing with six I was six years old and my whole family played tennis but just for fun never professional and when I turned to the age eight nine ten I was competing then in some you know in Austria they had some tournaments for juniors and and I was doing pretty well in my region as you say. so I'm from Styria where everybody knows Arnold Schwarzenegger so He's from my city. He was born in my city and um, I am from there. So there I was pretty well, pretty good player at the age from 10 till 12. And then um, I was going, we have sports schools and normal uh, real schools. And the thing is that in a normal real school, they don't take care about sports so much. They don't. So it was tough to practice full time. And in the sports schools, you have to go one more year. Um, into the school later, uh, but you can do your sports next to it. Um, so I, at the age of 14, 15, I changed to one of the sports schools, but I was not a great player. I was I was maybe, at, at this time, I was number four or five in my region. So it's in Austria, I was anywhere. It was not really great. And then I, I we have a big exam with 18 at, at the sports school with 19. And um, I get to that point that I played then with 18 um, a satellite. I don't know if you know that still a satellites were like 15, 10, 15 years ago, um, where we had like four tournaments in total, four ATP tournaments. And the last one is the Masters. And this is the tournaments where you start the career satellites and futures at the beginning of your career. And at this time I went to my first satellite and I just did two doubles points. That was, and I came back, and then I got the invitation from uh, Günther Bresnik, which is the ex-coach from Dominic Team, and um, he invited me to come to Vienna for a practice week with all the other guys. And yeah, they basically kicked my ass there, if I can say that. Um, I, I, I found my boundaries because they made me play there six, seven hours a day. Uh, pure tennis and I was dead in the evening but then I got home after this one week and I suddenly played three classes better and I got get to my father and said listen uh, what what am I gonna do now I'm do I try now to get really on the professional tour in singles or am I shall I do the big exam but then I have to stay home and I have to learn more 
and um, after long talkings, also with the school, uh, they say, okay, I'm gonna try now this half year um, just in tennis. How I'm gonna do, and I can do the exam later or one year later. And then, yeah, it was it was going pretty fast. So I was uh, in this in this half year, six months, I was coming basically from zero ranking till 400 pretty fast. And then I was with the age of 18, 19, I was one of the best uh, young kids. I was 160 in the world. So it was going pretty well. And but then I got a, a chronic uh, shoulder inju injury, a nerve impingement, which hit me back pretty long. It was almost one year, one and a half years so, you know, took me uh, to build up my muscles because they went at the beginning so a lot of doctors and physiotherapists and everybody had this different opinion from operation to that to that and that finally I had a good physiotherapist to said you have to build up your muscles around in the back and after one and a half years my ranking got back to 500 something I started again hit a lot of roadblocks also and and um, of course the mentally I was also not the strongest I have to say um was some years in in germany and finally i i got a very good mental coach one with mental exercises in italy was alberto castellani who bring me in the top 100 in singles and uh that was a big breakthrough because i had a lot of naysayers in my career who told me i will never be a good tennis player not even in austria or whatever and i was always one who kept on standing up when I got knocked down and also try even harder after and, and I think that keep, kept, kept me going in many ways in my career because I often wanted to quit already tennis several times due to also a lot of injuries uh, and and yeah setbacks and and yeah I had a great career I have to say I was three years top 100 in singles and after that um, I had one bad year with injuries but that changed me then to my doubles career where I had for sure my, my best results. Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a very influential story. So thanks for sharing that. And obviously you, you, you defied the odds where obviously you, you were a late bloomer and you started your career, a career later than the others. And then obviously at the age of 37, you won your first doubles grand slam. And then, uh, which is which is obviously an, an achievement on its own because a lot of people would think that you retire at that age. And then, um, obviously, in the finals of the 2018 Australian op Australian Open, what was going through your mind? Because I know pre in the previous year you lost in one of the finals, and then it's yes. all obviously the mental challenge. How did you overcome that and actually triumph? Well. Um... I have to go a little bit back because when I started to playing with Mate Pavic at the first time, we both came from split partnerships. We were both disappointed and it started around March. I think Miami we started and we didn't play well at the beginning at all. We, we didn't have great results. We were both around 20, 30 in the ranking and we expected good things, but not with, with no confidence on the tour nowadays it's very difficult to win matches and uh, we came then in the grass court season it was in 2017 and um, we sit before the grass court season together and say listen um, I mean we said we're gonna play still more the grass court season uh, but after we're gonna go separate ways because we didn't play well before and both didn't have a great feeling and okay so we went to the grass court season and boom uh, final three finals in a row, grass court season. I was a little bit unlucky. I, w I got injured, I had to retire in one final with my wrist coming to Wimbledon and I, we didn't even know if I can play because I, I retired the tournament before. I, I had four days to play in Wimbledon. I, I flew quick to Germany to my doctor. I get uh, two injections in my wrist some special treatment and not even practicing one time in Wimbledon I started I went we went to our first match of course we had confidence because we win a lot of matches but I didn't even know I, I didn't practice before how is my wrist so in the first match um, I had a little bit pain but we won it and then I was pain free from the second match had on the on the other side also a very good draw I think till the finals we didn't have one seeded team so it, it's unbelievable for a Grand Slam 
And then we played an unbelievable match against Kubot Mello, which we lost uh, after four hours, 45 minutes, 13, 15 in the fifth set, I think, or, or 11, 13. And it hurt it a lot. It hurt it a lot, I have to say, because it was an unbelievable uh, level we played. But that match helped us to be better in the final in Australia. Um, on the top, I mean, we had a huge amount of confidence. After that final in Wimbledon, of course, we stayed together. At the end of the year, we win the tournament. We got alternate in in the London finals. We beat the Bryan brothers in two sets. And we come to the 2018 season with a lot of confidence. We win the first two tournaments. I was injured before also in my back in, in December. I didn't practice one time. I come to the tournament in Doha right away. And I just break this two days, one and a half hours, and we win the tournament. We didn't lose one set, which is also a miracle. I don't know how, but don't ask me how. But um, yeah, it happened. We go to, we fly to Oakland, win the tournament also, and then we get to the Australian Open. Uh, didn't lose a match the whole year. Actually, we were 20 matches unbeaten already because if we count the tournament in Stockholm, Vienna I had to retire, and the, and the Masters, we were 20 matches undefeated. So that's a huge amount of confidence and uh, we played well in the Australian Open and we get to the final where we had, I would say, a little advantage. We played the Colombians and they were the first time in the finals in the Grand Slam. They didn't play their best, I have to say. We were tired, but we used our moment when we had our break chances and uh, yeah, won my first Grand Slam, which is for sure the highlight of my career. Absolutely. and. How did you feel at the time when you finally won the Grand Slam? Like, what went through you? Because I know you overcame a lot of adversities where you had injuries, you mentioned, and also a lot of ups and downs in your career. So what was the feeling? <laughs> this I will also never forget in my life. Yeah. I would celebrate it more, but my partner mm -hmm. didn't know that we won. It was unbelievable. I mean, uh, we had uh, five free and I know I have to serve it out, and he, he he thought it's for free. So I served it out with zero the last game, and I want to throw on the floor, and then in one second I look at him, and he's looking in the air. So you look at your partner, and you want to celebrate, but you see his face, and you think, did I make a mistake in counting? And you know, then a lot of matches <laughs> go in the other way <laughs> if you miscalculate it. But in one second, in one second, you hear the referee like game set match, and I was so relieved. So the moment was a little bit ruined because I wanted to celebrate, and he, he didn't even know it. I couldn't believe it. But it was, I mean, it was an unbelievable feeling. I mean, we both, uh, I throw on the floor because it's my, it's my favorite Grand Slam, the Australian Open. I mean, I love this tournament since the beginning. I was there. It's an amazing Grand Slam, and uh, yeah. I fulfilled uh, my dream a little bit and uh, it, was, it was an unbelievable feeling. That's great. And let's talk about people obviously behind the success, where whether they are coaches, mentors or family. Who would you attribute your success to in life? Um, it's difficult to put that, to put it in one person because I have to say also, I mean, you know, you always have good relationships with coaches, some bad relationship with coaches, you know, and I don't want to point out that this one was bad, this one was good. I, I think you pick from everybody something good out of it. Even if you have not a great relationship or not ending good relationships, you try to pick out the good things from the guy. I mean, I'm also not an easy person and I also have my mistakes. So you, if you ever from everybody pick out some stuff where you can learn something, I think that's the best. Uh, I mean, my wife also supports me a lot in my career. She, I mean, she's, I think, different to other wives who always give you sugar, you know, and say, yeah, but it's bad luck. As said. She's really tough on me, but that also helped me to be stronger and, and, and being a better tennis player as before. I mean, I, I'm also, I have my mistakes. And mentally, as I said, I was also never the best and, and I had to improve a lot. Um, and still, st I'm still, I still have to improve a uh, a lot of things, um, but uh, I think it's it's overall, um, if from all the persons I had, you pick out really your things, you improve the most. So there's not really one person who helped you the most. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's always great to have, obviously, a very supportive life partner. So definitely yeah. lucky on that side. So uh, tough luck at the recent uh, Paris Masters where you were partnered with Rohan Bopana. And yeah. obviously in a well-contested match, especially the second set, we were trying to come back from the 6-0 that he lost in the first first set. So talk about that match. Like, if you look back at it, what do you think went wrong and where you could have improved? Well, we had a little sloppy start. Um, I think Bob started and we didn't have any first serve there. And this is a team who has the best returns on the tour. I mean, you, I know Jürgen pretty well. I played with him by myself. And the other one is also a great returner. And, and then uh, having... Uh, having uh, not a lot of first serves in the first set or first game especially it was tough so we run uh, we run behind already we get a break they had a really good start they played well and we spoke we sit there together and we knew okay zero six means nothing i said we take this as a warm-up set but then we have to change some things get better um we changed the return side also um and and um yeah, it was it was after it was good. It was very close. I mean, uh, we had a couple of last thirties. We we didn't do it. Some points were a little bit unlucky. A major point was also the one game where Jürgen served Jürgen Melzer, and we had last thirty, and then he had a second serve, and he 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 served an ace in the middle on the line on me. So that could go either way. That's a risky move. And but but they have confidence also. I mean, they they are now in the Masters, and this is then these moves you do when you have confidence, and they are coming. And and uh, I know the feeling, and I, I know how they play. So you have to come up with something. And they were better better at this time. And uh, we had also set point, and uh, sir, I serve on a set point in the tie break. So we were very close. This match could go in a different way if we make the big points count for us, but we were not able. Uh, we always lost the big points in the moment that was set because I think we we fight it good. We came back good after a 0-6. Also the match before against uh, Rocher and uh, Martin, we fight it very well because they were much better and we, we find a way somehow through the match and we managed to win it uh, at the end. And this is, this is what good doubles teams uh, do playing not their best tennis, but managed to win the match somehow. And, and, and we did this, the first two matches. It was sadly in the in the quarterfinal, we couldn't do it. But it was, uh, the second set was totally okay that we lost it. First set, we overslept it, <laughs> let's say. Mm. I'm sure you come back stronger. So, uh, so talking about, obviously, would you say doubles game is more challenging than the singles game because obviously you have to complement your partner's playing style and adjust the chemistry between your playing partner as well for me it's a different sport i mean doubles and singles mm. you cannot really compare singles you're alone you uh you belong to as a you you rely to your own mistakes you cannot you know you cannot talk to someone um you the tactics you have your tactics and and it's from movement wise and, and fitness wise you need to be much fitter in singles as in doubles it's different it's quickness and reaction and a little bit more speed so for me it's completely something else in, in doubles obviously you rely to your partner too uh, the most important is that you have a good relationship and, and the communication is very important um, some teams manage it not talking so much and and uh, um, they do their stuff. Yeah, some some teams need to talk. So there are a lot of different doubles types out there nowadays. It's different as before. It got very very close. There are much more good doubles teams as before. Also the singles guys they play much better now. Um, they volley much better and 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 as you could see now in Paris for example. Um, Kurkac and and Alassim win the doubles title and they played a really good week. So it's getting tough out there, getting tough. And next year anyway, we were, we have to see where doubles is going because as as everybody could see, um, the, the, there is a huge uh, price cut also in the price money. And so doubles is then much less money. And uh, we have to see then how many doubles guys can still play then on the tour because there will be also a gap 
depending on how many tournaments we have next year. Because if we have less tournaments, then the cutoff will be always very strong and the guys, I would say between 50 and backwards, they can't even play the tournament. So we have to see what's going to happen there. Hopefully the, it's going to be run a little bit better. But I think the next, the first three, four months is not going to change a lot. Hmm. And why do you think um, like the doubles game hasn't received the same amount of spotlight or limelight from um, whether it's the media or the industry uh, as as much as the singles game, obviously? Well, it has always been like that. I mean, singles was always more presented also in the media. Doubles is just sometimes presented even in, in 250s or some 500 or bigger tournaments. You don't even see the final in the TV. So, um, yeah, media-wise, it has for sure the biggest potential. Also commercialized. I mean, uh, if you go out there and, and uh, I mean, if you speak about some top teams now, uh, no, nobody knows of. Uh, okay, the Bryant brothers were the most important guys, I think, out there. But then uh, worldwide scene, if you tell some Davos guys somewhere else, nobody knows them just in their country. So it's going to be... It's it's difficult because and it, and it's sad I have to say because um, I think doubles is played worldwide the most sports uh, the more people play doubles as singles. Uh, if I go home uh, I see all the guys playing in the clubs and uh, not not the pros now at uh, the M's <laughs> and uh, the amateurs mm. and and uh, um, they play most of the time doubles and it's it's yeah it's it's sad but it's like that and it has always been like that. There's nothing you can change. Try, the ATP, of course, tried to promote it better and uh, tries to make it somehow better, but it's still not great, I would say. Mm, and that's unfortunate, obviously. So yeah. while we're discussing while we're discussing doubles, let's talk about mixed doubles. And because you've had some good runs in mixed doubles as well, how does it compare to the doubles game? Is it very different? Is it similar? I don't know. Um, I've played mixed. Sometimes, no, I have to say not, not often. Um, well, it depends how you see it. Some players play it for fun, but if you want to win a Grand Slam, you hit to, must have, play full. That, that means you hit full also on the woman, which is sometimes if you have some feelings, it's tough. <laughs> because yeah. I mean, to hit a full, uh, I don't know, volley or smash or a hard forehand to a woman. I mean, don't, don't understand me wrong. They are very good players and, and mm -hmm. some volley unbelievable and related too, but it's just, tough you know i have sometimes even problems to hit it to a man heart you know like what you what you should do and uh, mm. then to the woman there it's 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 tough but uh if you if you want to win the grand slam i mean you have to play full power to everyone so that's how it is and it's fun it's it's a lot of tactics you need to see what is the strength from your partner how you can help her and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, find a way to win the match. But it's it's really fun. I like it. When I played it, I always enjoyed to play it and uh, had some fun out there. Hmm. Yeah. And obviously, tennis is uh, one of the one of the games where you actually get women and men get to play together. So that's the b beauty of tennis. So um, just going in a different direction. So tennis obviously has always been considered a sport of the elite rich people playing the sport and do you think in the recent years that mentality has changed or has it still stayed what are, what is your opinion well, on that what do you mean that the rich did you say rich people play the sports or i didn't yeah so okay. so rich people so yeah um i would say it like that um tennis is a very expensive sport i mean the mm. costs the costs we have is ridiculous. Everybody thinks we do our millions out there. They go on our profile in the ATP World Tour and they see our prize money with, I don't know, from three, four millions, five millions, 10 millions, 13 millions. Um, and I want to tell the people out there now, this is not the amount we have. Yeah, You have to calculate from this amount taxes off, which is most of the players have, I would say, 30 to 50 percent taxes. And the mm. expenses which is also not there written. The expenses is crazy in tennis because if you, for example, take a coach with you, you have to pay his flight. You have to pay his hotel room because you not want to stay with your coach all the time in the same bed or hotel room. 
sometimes they do it to save money, but then you have to give him his salary per week. Um, then you have bonus in the week percentage. So it's, it's really the expenses are super, super high. And it's a very expensive sport also to start with because at the beginning you have to think you can just play the little tournaments. So let's say you play future, um, you win the tournament in the future, you're plus minus zero with your expenses. If you win the tournament and you get your prize money, you're plus minus zero. If you have a coach, probably you're zero. So it's very tough at the beginning, it's super tough. So you need some good of, uh, like a little healthy, not, I don't want to say rich, but uh, medium healthy background to to make you play. I was lucky that uh, my father make this dream happen for me. Otherwise I wouldn't play tennis. And I want to thank a lot to my parents who supported me there hundred percent. And uh, yeah, having said that then, Rich, rich, a rich game. Well, yeah, I mean, everybody play tennis, but to get up, you need a really financial background, or you're so good that you get really good sponsors, which is nowadays also difficult. But if you have, if you're a super talent who has a very good ad- attitude, because it changed a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, from my perspective on, uh, maybe other ones have a different pers- perspective, but my perspective is if, if you're just talented nowadays, but you're not a fighter, you don't want to give every day like 100% on the court and you, you rely on your, ah, I'm talented enough, this will work out. It's not going to work out, I tell you. You can't be so talented, this is not going to work out. You must give every day 100%. The 100% will be not the same every day. Sometimes you struggle, sometimes it hurts. But if you have the mentality to give 100%, you have will have probably a chance or opportunity to be up there. Yeah, But that's why I'm not a huge fan anymore of huge talent. I'm more a fan of fighting skills. You give everything. You need to be fit. The, the players nowadays, they are much more fit than 15 years ago. Everybody's fit. Everybody can play tennis. Everybody has good shots now. So it's really tough to get up. It's it's really it must work really hard. Mm, absolutely. And then on that note, who is your most favorite tennis player of all time? Oof, of all time. Well, at the beginning of my career, I was a fan, of course, of Thomas Muster, not because he's Austrian, but his fighting skills um, after he came back from his accident. And he, it's pretty amazing what he did. I also loved uh, also Pete Sampras. I mean, I don't have a really one idol. I mean, they're all, if you look now, the last four or two generations, I mean, Rafa, Roger, Joker, how they play, how they dominate the game. Yeah, still now, it's it's amazing how these guys play. They, they play another level. These, these, these top 10 guys, or the top four, I want to say it, because they're continuously almost four or five. They're a different level. It's it's unbelievable. It's nice to watch them play tennis. I mean, even now, if you, if I see now Rafa practicing, it's unbelievable the intensity he practiced, how his balls are coming. It's it's a, it's amazing. I saw him now before also in French Open, and it's 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 crazy how this guy was playing, for example, at the French Open. Um, hmm. Yeah. But I don't. I didn't really have one one specific idol. I had always a combination of a couple of players. Yeah, always, always. I'm the same. I, I love the big three, and I loved all the old old players. Jim Courier, uh, from the, from Pete the old Sampras, players, yeah. I, I like some young players too. I mean, of course, I mean, I like Dominic. I mean, the guy is unbelievable. His strokes, I think nobody hits so hard the ball as him. Um, then um, who else is there? I mean, Zverev is unbelievable. He improved a lot this year. Um, serving now also much better as before. Had a, had a good run now also at the last couple of weeks. I want to see him how he does in the Masters. Uh, Rublev, unbelievable this year. I mean, I know him. I practiced with him like two years ago, three years ago in Politeris, where he was just, uh, he was also already shooting the ball around, but had, it didn't have a really concept yet. Uh, but now he plays unbelievable. I mean, his mm. coach. Made, make a very good job. He's a great team behind him, so he improved a lot. Very nice kid, also. And there are a lot of there is a couple of young kids coming up who have potential. 
uh, Sinner, to, for example, in the next years we will see more from him. So there, there's coming a lot of uh, good kids because, I mean, these top four, they are not playing forever. I don't know how, how long Rafa want to play still. Uh, or Joker uh, or what is doing Roger, but they will stop in the next years and then uh, this the new generation is coming. Eh? Absolutely. And like you said, like we don't know when these all of these are going to hang your hand their rackets. So also talking about the the secret ingredient behind the obviously the longevity of your career, how you played for so long. What's your key to success other than obviously staying fit? What what do you think is is makes or breaks a player? Well, I mean, my most my most strength, I think, is when I was getting knocked down. Is it losing or having an injury or somebody said something or whatever? I was always trying to or willing, willing to work harder, to fight back harder, to come back harder. The motivation was huge. So this was, this is one thing. Um, I had a lot of injuries. I had maybe almost every injury you, injury you can have. I have to knock the, luckily I didn't have an injury where I'm out one, two years, what some guys had, for example, um, Alexander Beyer was a very, is a great Austrian doubles player. He was also top 100 in singles. He was number four or five in the world in doubles. Uh, or three even and and played very well with Bruno Suarez. He he got the elbow injury and he had to operate. And uh, he didn't uh, recover yet from that. So it's two years out already. He had a second inch uh, second operation already, and uh, it's very tough, you know. And I didn't have that. I was a little bit unlucky. I had uh, in 2012. I had an accident at the tournament as in Hamburg and um, it was not my fault. There were like iron sticks inside the court and I break my leg there almost. I was lucky that oh. I can, could continue playing tennis again. I, 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 I had the ankle support around my leg. Otherwise I had to stop playing tennis. I would have uh, open bone splittering and everything. And, and I had a bad enough injury from that too, but it took me six months six and a half months to recover from that. So all my ranking went down. That's why I was four years top 10 in doubles. And then uh, from 2012, you could see I dropped to 60, 70 in the ranking. And it, it took me four or five years till 270, 17 to come back after this injury. So that was a big setback for me also. But uh, I managed to come back somehow and uh, yeah, had still two, three good years, uh, and now I will see what I'm going to do next year. Uh, <laughs> I'm also 40, so I'm going to see how it's how it's going to be, how is my body lasting, and, and try, just trying to get now more fit because I had a very tough time during the first uh, lockdown pandemic here in, in, in Panama, and uh, yeah, I'm going to see. We hope you keep playing for long. And uh, Oliver, who is the toughest opponent that you faced? The toughest opponent? Well, the toughest, I mean, the most matches I lost was against the Bryan brothers. Right, uh, yeah. The, I think the first, the first eight, nine matches I lost to them. And my first match I win against them was with Janko Tip Sarevic. Uh, you know him for sure, he was top 10 in singles, very great uh, Serbian tennis player. And um, that was in Miami. And after that, I, um, I beat them a couple of times then uh, with Fabrice Martin, also with Mate Pavic. So it, I was then winning more. Uh, but the first first years were frustrating. Um, uh, I mean, I have huge respect from them. They are the best doubles team ever, for sure. Uh, and and uh, I'm still in good contact with with uh, Bob Bryan. And um, I'm going to also visit him now in Miami to do a little preseason. He's still hitting some balls, even though he retired. But uh, yeah. This is the team I, I had my most losses, I think. And then, of course, I mean, 
Herbert Mahut, great doubles team. Um, Melo Kubot was also a good doubles team. Um, or is, no, was, sorry, because they don't play anymore next year. So, uh, yeah, there are some good doubles teams out there, but the most, most uh, guys I lost to was for sure the Bryan brothers. Which are Absolutely. a lot of doubles teams. They kick a lot of asses from doubles teams, so I think they have pretty good records to the others too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Agreed. And uh, um, so obviously we're talking about what's next for you. Any, have you thought about when, till when do you want to extend your career? Or is that all in the open right now? Well, I always told my wife, when you have, when you have a family, things change a lot also in, when you play tennis because um, you are not home a lot. So I was traveling uh, many, many weeks and when you have one kid, it's okay, still manageable, but two is tough. And now they go to school also. And, and I told my wife, I play this sport as long as it's profitable. So that means that as long as I do money in these sports, I will do it. Um, now we have this problem with the pandemic and uh, the price money has gone very low. So mm. we saw now how the, lo how the last 12 weeks were and um, yeah, I will for sure play next year at the beginning till um, trying to play also the Olympics. Um, that's one of my big goals still. But then I will see because um, not seeing my family, being home and, and not doing really financially well, um, it's not worth it not to see a family. And then I will, I will see what I can do in the future. Um, I think I will personally stay in tennis, have some thoughts already, what I'm going to do, something with uh, special clinics, doubles clinics already. Um, I've thought about a lot already the last months. Um, doing something special even with a partner um, and uh, yeah we'll see we will see where this goes because um, right now I, I just I still have to see I don't even have a doubles partner for next year so I have to see with whom I will play in the next one one week 10 days who is uh, still available and uh, then I'm gonna yeah gonna try one more time to play good next year and uh yeah everything is open then <laughs> we'll see absolutely and also talking about finding a partner because sometimes you don't live in the same obviously country you don't live in the same place how how hard it is to find a partner then obviously get together to practice because you do need to practice together as well i mean it it sounds tough but it is not really tough because we know each other everybody know each other i mean they right. so you have everybody's phone number. Uh, it's of course it's easier when you are at the tournament. Like for example, being now in London Masters, nice to be there and see because some some teams split up and to talk with the guys. But you have the phone number, and you see and then you hear also the things. It's like everybody talks and then uh, you have to see also who fits to your game. I mean sometimes just playing with a good guy who is a great doubles player, but does he really fits to your game? For example, I have mm. a different doubles game as, as the doubles guys. They maybe like uh, service volley players and I play from the back mainly. So maybe they, it doesn't suit them. And I, for example, I was playing, I was playing now with Raven class and then he played all his career mainly with service volley guys. And it, that's why we split because it didn't work so well because it was a different game. And, and we, we said then, okay, it doesn't fit so well. So we go, that's why we went different ways. Uh, mm. But um, you have to find somebody who really suits your game and also suit to his game. And that's, I think, a key of a successful doubles team. Yeah? yeah. And what would you consider your biggest asset so far in your career? Is it has been your service, has been your forehand, your backhand? What do you think? Well, I would say 10 years ago, it was for sure uh, my ground strokes, forehand. but I had to change my game too in doubles because if I would still play like 10 years ago, I wouldn't play any more doubles. I would be too bad. So I improve a lot mm -hmm. my service, especially my second service. Um, 
the returns I improve also because um, I played with Kubo at the beginning at the new site and I went now the last years to the ad. So I was improving everything a little bit, but there's always room to improve in every uh, job in life, not even just in tennis. Yeah. And you are never yeah. really settled and perfect in anything. So I'm still even now, just last week uh, in, in um, Paris, for example, uh, Bob, so Bobana is traveling with his coach, Scotty Davidoff, and we just uh, he took me for one session for a practice to make some things better, and this session helped me so much that I played the next match, next two matches, that was before the Matin match, Matin and Rocher match, that helped me already so much, this practice session, that I played much better in the in these next two matches. So sometimes you need also a reminder if, for example, we didn't play here now five months uh, in this pandemic here, I was in Panama, I could play four months, two weeks tennis. So that's why I came to the tournaments completely unfit, no, not having played tennis and to play shocking. Uh, but then with little reminders and, uh, we're, you know, what you practiced before, what you did good, it makes a little bit click and then you play in one practice suddenly much better as you did before. And that's what you need. Absolutely. And so far, obviously, had a very good chat with you, Oliver. Uh, but before we wrap up, obviously, the obvious question is asking you any advice that you would give to the young players who are just starting out in their careers? Well, it's the same what I said before. I mean, if you if young players really, first they have to know, do you want to get a professional player or not? Because playing for fun out there, it's okay. Huh? Uh, but if you really want to get professional, you have to speak to yourself and say, hey, do I really want this? I, have, I must be willing to fight my ass off out there. You must be really give 100 percent every day even i said before it's not gonna be the same you're gonna have muscle fever you're gonna have pain one day this hurt one day that hurts whatever it is try to give mm. your best you will not play the same but if you have this attitude you will get i think late, later in life and it's not just in tennis before it's also in other perspectives of life you will get the chance or maybe the opportunity to do something good and that's the most important what what mm. i can give you on this way for the kids because uh there are too many also i don't want to talk bad bad now but there's also the, the, it's also very important from the parents because the, mm. the the kid should choose if you want to play or not sometimes parents push a lot or they force the kid to play it and if they don't really even like it it's also tough you know so it's really it must be a very good team behind you as i said my parents were behind me all the time and they never pushed me doing anything so that, that that that's when you want it as a kid as a player it's perfect if you have the great attitude and this i think it's the most important thing absolutely that's 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 great advice uh, oliver and um just before obviously we 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 part our ways i, I just want to obviously uh, congratulate you on an awesome career that you've had, although you obviously had a late start, late peaking start to it. And uh, and just a snapshot of your career is an inspiration to many, obviously, people who are suffering from injuries or having downs in their careers. So very inspirational career. Thank you. Thank you for entertaining us with your tennis and with your, obviously, with your resilience and inspiring us all, uh, whether it's us behind the screens, watching your game or or budding tennis uh, enthusiasts who are just starting out or even young players who are obviously facing difficulties. So I wish you and congratulate you um, and I wish you the best of luck for the future. Um, so and hopefully, hopefully you have much more, uh, many more years of playing uh, and we can keep seeing you on the court. And obviously I'm sure we will. Uh, and uh, Oliver, thanks again for your time. You're all, yeah, thank you very much. You're very kind. Thanks again. Wish you all the best and thank you very much for having me. Take care, guys. Thank you. And hopefully, we'll see you. So I'll, hopefully, I'll meet you someday in person in Australia. Perfect. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. See ta -ta. Ta -ta. Bye bye.